Welcome to Inside the Game, Past, Present, and Future. This afternoon, I'm visiting with Coach George Ravling, a uh, longtime coach and now uh, Director of International Basketball for, uh, for Nike. And we, we've had a lot of these discussions over the course of the years, Coach, and I think something that a lot of people would be interested in talking about and hearing about is how recruiting college basketball has recruiting has changed over the course of years back from when you were a player, you were an assistant, you were a head coach, and now uh, the coaches and staffs we both see uh, constantly, how it's totally uh, evolved. I mean, it used to be kind of a, it's still an all-consuming thing, but in terms of uh, NCAA rules regarding recruiting, in terms of exposures and how many times you could go out and have contact with the player and his family, it used to be unlimited. Now it's very, very limited. I mean, I'm sure from your days with Lefty Drizel at Maryland and your days at Villanova and stuff, you, you can think of some examples where you, you when you targeted a player, you probably become almost like a, a family member with the kid. Well, I, I think, Frank, what has, has changed is it's a totally different culture now, and the cultures are driven by by a, a variety of things, be it NC2A legislation, be it technology, uh, be it uh, the uh, summer basketball circuit, all those things have contributed greatly to the in, in the evolution of a new culture back in in the in the in the early uh 60s in the late 60s uh you didn't have the uh the impact of rules that impeded your ability to do recruiting uh you could bring a player in for a visit uh, uh a, a, as often as you wanted uh, there were no limits on how many visits a player could take. If a player, for example, uh, Moses Malone, when he was in high school, took close to uh, 30 campus visits in that, you could work the guys out on campus when you were there. You could go to see them play as much as you, uh, as you wanted. You could go visit them as much as possible. I remember when I was working for Lefty, uh, I had been on the road for about two weeks, and I got back, and my wife says, hey, uh, a lefty wants you to call him, so I called, and he said, "Hey, uh, I, I, the word I'm getting is Stu Aberdeen, who was then the, the assistant, top assistant at Tennessee, uh, was uh, was up in Windsor, Connecticut. Windsor, Connecticut was the hometown of Tom Roy. He was one of the probably the most highly recruited big man in the country that year. And so he says, and we found out that uh, Stu's been up there." For a week at the Holiday Inn, so Lefty says, "Get your ass up there and don't come back." So I, I I get up the next morning, drive to Windsor, Connecticut, and I stay in the Holiday Inn. I'm up there for three weeks, and I'm, I'm sorry, in Howard Johnson's. I'm I'm up there for three weeks, and every day same thing. Get up in the morning, go over to the school, spend the most of the day over at the school in the evening, maybe try to go by, see the coach or the, or, or the principal or the guidance counselor or someone who had influence with Tom. You go watch practice. But today you couldn't do that. You, and, and the other thing was, I think, in those days, you could really build a relationship with the, with the, with the prospect, his parents, his coach, the principal, and you, and you really had a chance for a, a, a two-way evaluation. They got a chance to evaluate you, and you got a chance to evaluate them and also to build a, a, a trusting relationship. So it was a lot different in those days. Uh, and you didn't, you didn't have uh, the clutter of things for a young person to, to consider in making his value judgments. You didn't have one and done. Uh, you didn't have the huge salaries. And I, as I said to you when we talked earlier, when I came out of Villanova in 1960, I was the second round pick for the Philadelphia Warriors. And I went down and talked with Eddie Gottlieb and they offered me 8,200. Well, I, I, I could start work at Sunoco for 8,000. So, and I knew I wasn't a pro player, so I went on to work. But see, today you don't have the, you, you, the choices are so m much different. The other thing, back in those days, the parents were really focused on the kid getting a four-year education. The scholarship was a conduit to get a get a college degree. To, today, uh, the scholarship is it really just provides a, a, a way station temporarily while you put in your time because of the rules. 
And so in those days, the parents were 100% supportive of you as the coach. Today, uh, that that's not necessarily true any, uh, anymore. In fact, I would say nine out of 10 cases, the parents are going to be far more uh, protective of the child than they are uh, the coach. Do you think that coach, and the prime example you're talking about getting the, the family, basically the, the parents and maybe extended members of the family, be it brothers and sisters or uncles or grandparents in the high school coach. <laughs> now, as you well know, I, I think back to a story not too long ago, a, 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 three or four years ago in a summer tournament in Las Vegas, and an assistant coach was watching a player, a very high-profile player who's down in the NBA, and the assistant coach showed me this list of those about 18 names with, with the person's name and the relationship with the players. He goes, these are all the people that I've got to know their names. I've got to know who they are. i got to know who they are. Because if I disrespect any of these people or don't acknowledge them, who knows how much that's going to hurt me. So you're, you're like a good example. You know, this doesn't happen all the time, but it happens a large majority of the time that you ha have so many people now who are involved in the recruiting process opposed to back then the kid, his parents, his high school coach, generally, and maybe a few more. Nowadays, you've got... Cousins, you know, uncles, brothers, stepdads, people who are, you know, because of the fact that, as you said, that the, the, the pie at the end of the sky in terms of what, what this kid can eventually realize, so many people probably legitimately or not so legitimately want to be part of that process so they can kind of be part of it and reap some of these benefits. Yeah, well, and, and one of the, the, the big differences, uh, uh, Frank, was in the in 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 the fifties and uh, I mean sorry in, in the uh, early sixties uh, and in the late sixties, um, you, you you could go to visit a a, a player and 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 this happened to me a number of times, particularly in the deep south during the times of segregation. You couldn't find a place to stay. The parents might say, "Well, coach, you came all the way down here from Philadelphia. You stay 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 here at, at the house with us." And and I, and I can remember numerous times when I was recruiting Porter where I either stayed at his coach's Howard, house. Howard Porter. Or, or Howard yeah. Porter. He was from Booker High in Sarasota, Florida. Went on to, to play at Villanova. So, so you, you, you actually either stayed with the coach and his wife or you stayed with the prospect and his family and, and, and you'd, you'd eat meals there. And, and uh, you know, I, I remember Bob Gottlieb telling me that when he was recruiting a, 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 one of the prospects uh, when he was at uh, Creighton, that he stayed, he stayed uh, at the prospect's house for three nights in a row. Yeah. The parents put him up. So, you know, the, 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 that, the culture was just so different then. But after a while, the, you, you were able to, to nurture a relationship that really uh, ended up being a trustful relationship. Yeah, yeah, you think that coach now, I mean, you, you look at the present, I think what the number is, 300 to 300 plus players on the Division One levels that have left their programs this year to transfer. Now, obviously, to, to the programs, obviously, there's a multitude of reasons. But you think back, and, and again, you wonder that, I mean, certainly the numbers were nowhere near that even 10 years ago. And certainly uh, when, the, when the idea that a player would transfer was, well, he's either flunked out, uh, he's got family problems at home, or maybe he just doesn't want to play basketball. I mean, I, I would think very few people quit based on, well, I, this coach is you know, not giving me a fair shakes. He's hurting my chances of getting to the NBA as quickly as possible. And I think a lot of that had to do with, as you say, the, the NBA thing. But also because, you know, maybe nowadays, maybe a, a head coach sees a player once or twice a summer at an event, and they sign them because uh, of the early signing period. And there's really not a chance to get to know each other and really not a good chance for the coach to get a real feel for really how good this player can be and really can this kid fit into my program. Well, I think, I think you get a lot of false readings now because, because you don't always have an authentic competitive environment in which the kid's playing. He might be playing against very poor teams. Where one he doesn't have to he doesn't have to expend as much energy, so there's a temptation to say he doesn't play hard all the time. Also, uh, the the fact that they're, 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 uh, the the size factor, players who tend to, to be in the six five six 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 seven range who have these these mammoth uh, 240, 250 pound bodies 
they tend to dominate a lot in high schools. But it, it, as you continue to move up the level of uh, ladder of competition, uh, the size and the weight become uh, less meaningful. So I, I think you get a, you, you get a lot of false readings in in, in the game, and and, and uh, the other thing is the kids play three and four games a day, and so after a while fatigue has to take its place. You, you play three games a day for four days in a row. Uh, you're not sleeping well. You're not eating well. The teams get very little time to to practice. And so all those things, in my mind, have to play uh, a, a, a vital factor in, in your judgment of just how good and how authentic uh, of, a, of a player this person is. Well, one, one thing that we should probably touch upon this topic before we move on to some other things, coaches, you, we, we brought up the early signing period, if I'm not mistaken, mistaken I think it was sometime in the 83, 84, right around the, the, the Olympics when you were in working with Coach Knight on the 84 Olympic team in, here in Los Angeles. Do you think, in hindsight, because what this does is, is, what's, is, is well documented, it's kind of accelerated the recruiting process in years past. Previous to that, guys would sign letters of intent in, in the spring of his senior years, and by that time, you know, you, you, uh, coaching staff has seen a player X number of times his senior year in his high school setting, in his high school environment. So then... You know, you, you, you do the kid pretty well in terms of his personality and evaluation. Nowadays, I mean, there's a lot of head coaches, and as you well know, I don't know if you ever fell into this uh, ilk when you were still coaching, but there's a lot of coaches now, who, who may, head coaches, who may not even see a kid play for his real high school team uh, before the November signing period. He's seen him in a summer camp or an evaluation event or a, a tournament somewhere other than his high school team. So... You wonder if that's really, can you really, really know a player other than maybe his innate skills or his athleticism uh, until you've actually seen him in a setting where it's a more disciplined setting where, you know, the coach has to be a disciplinary in terms of making sure he goes to class and follow rules as opposed to a lot of these travel ball settings where the, it's not a real coach running things and he's just basically uh, been lured onto this team and there's no real discipline involved other than and make sure you show up on time and have the right uniform. Well, uh, you know, I, I think that you're absolutely right. It, a lot of the judgment is based on summer basketball. And I think that the, 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 the part that really uh, goes overlooked is the ever-increasing uh, role of the, a uh, decreasing role of the high school yes. coach. In the old days, when you went to a home visit, the parents were there, the high school coach was there. But now what has happened, because there's such an emphasis placed on performance during the summer, it, it, it heightens the relevance of, of the summer league coach, the coach that coaches those travel teams in the summer, and it decreases the value of the, of the high school coach. And so that, that has been, been an interesting dynamic. And so based on legislation, what we've done unintentionally, the unintended consequence is this, that we have devalued the high school coach and we have escalated the value of the summer coach. And, and with that uh, comes a, 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 another problem. The summer coach... Uh, what are his qualifications to be a summer coach? Uh, and, and, and what are his qualifications to mentor this child and, and so forth? And, and, and are there background checks being done? Is, should there be coaches certification for these uh, uh, individuals who coach teams in the summer? Just because they're called a coach yeah. does not mean that they are a coach. Yeah. Well, that's a great topic and one that we could talk about for, uh, for for hours and hours. I'm sure people will find it important. For now, let's call it uh, this session. And uh, Frank Burleson for Inside the Game, past, present, future, visiting with Coach George Ravley.